Hello, everyone. I'm Christine Hammond, the Executive Director of Prosecutors Center for Excellence. I'm joined by uh, Sophia Roche, Senior Attorney for Prosecutors for Center for Excellence, and our presenter today, Greg Rowe. Greg Rowe has extensive criminal justice and public safety experience at every level of uh, the system. He currently serves as the Executive Director of the Pennsylvania District Attorneys Association, where he's the position he's held since the beginning of 2021. Before that, for more than a decade, he was at the PDAA as their legislative and policy director. Uh, before that, he served as Governor Rendell's senior policy manager for public safety and as a special assistant for criminal justice. Greg started his career or early in his career uh, was in the appeals unit of the Philadelphia District Attorney's Office. And in the course of his long career, he has worked with the National Governors Association, the Council of State Governments, the Pew Center on the States to help officials from other states long learn about successful strategies in many areas of the criminal justice arena. Greg has also been selected as a participant in the Kennedy School of Government's executive session for state court leaders. Um, and so we are very lucky to have him join us today to talk about how to successfully incorporate procedural justice into prosecutor training. So Greg, I turn it over to you and thank you so much for joining us. It is great to be here and thank you for letting me uh, talk for a few minutes about procedural justice, and and you can you can see on the on the screen here um, from our from our website uh, we launched a a series in March of uh, 2021, really during the height of the pandemic, our uh, a briefing series, uh, a virtual briefing series on procedural justice. And just to give you a little bit of background on on how it worked, uh, these were this was a four part series on different aspects of procedural justice. And I'll, I'll go through some of the details in, in a couple of minutes, but it was a four part series. It was virtual. Uh, so it was not in person, but we did these all online for CLE credits and it was open to our, our, our state membership. People could see it live, it was virtual. But people could see the presenters when they were doing it live um, or people could uh, sign in afterward and watch it, uh, watch it taped from, from our website. We partnered with Villanova Law School, and that really was a key point that was great for, for many reasons. Uh, number one, Villanova, which is uh, just outside of Philadelphia, uh, has always been a big, uh, a big important stakeholder in a lot of criminal justice issues uh, in Pennsylvania. Um, they were able to provide us significant technical experience uh, putting on this kind of CLE. Uh, CLEs are not easy to do virtually, uh, but when you have multiple people in multiple parts of the state or country who are speaking uh, during, uh, during this presentation, having a sophisticated institution to help uh, really, really went, went, went a long way. Um, we also uh, spent a lot of time internally discussing what would this program would look like. And a lot of thought went into it. Um, a lot had gone on uh, in, in the world of criminal justice and social justice. Uh, we had all heard about procedural justice for, for years and, and some had a sense of what it was and, and, and others didn't. Uh, then, then the murder of, of George Floyd occurred and there were plenty more discussions about process, about racial justice, about equity. Um, about implicit bias, about explicit bias, and, and, and many other areas. And this really presented us an opportunity to, to do a number of things, to, to highlight some of the really important things that different prosecutors around the state had done in the world of, of diversion, in the world of working with their communities. It was also an opportunity to challenge uh, our, our prosecutors and, and, and those who were uh, part of our membership on various issues of public policy and to remind folks of the importance that procedure has in the everyday uh, workings of, of the court system. Our procedure for uh, defendants, for victims, for anyone else, witnesses, anyone else involved in the criminal justice system. 
procedural fairness is, was critical. Um, and it was also a way to reflect some of the discussions that continued uh, and continue to this day uh, to be a part of our, our discourse on, on public policy and of being stewards of, of justice. Um, that was sort of the, I mean, sort of the procedural aspect to this procedural lecture, um, but it really was important, we thought, to, uh, to get buy-in, uh, to get uh, for the sake of, 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 of credibility and being able to bring in speakers both from the outside uh, and from within our organization. So if we go to the next slide, um, you can see uh, a, a, a note that was our, formed our, our press release. And the specific verbiage isn't as important as just sort of noting the detail that, that we went into in, in announcing it and explaining it. And I think that's reflective of the work that went on, again, from, from the beginning in terms of defining procedural justice, having discussions within our membership, asking ourselves what we thought it meant, um, and then being able to have a presentation that was relevant, um, that was in some parts theoretical, in some parts academic, but in most parts, um, real life, real life examples, best practices, things that we all know we can do better, areas we need to explore. So a couple of the, the, the phrases here that, that I wanna highlight, and then we can turn to some of the specifics about, about the trainings. Um, you notice our, that the, the third paragraph, our DA from one of our larger counties, who's the chair of our training committee said, this briefing series is meant to be a productive way to learn about the issues of the day. The intent is to provide another way to learn, grow and assess how to best ensure that all communities are peaceful, the scales of justice are balanced, and we are engaged in ways to prevent crime from happening in the first place. I think those sentences really define what we were trying to do. It is at all times about ensuring community safety. It is at all times about ensuring that we are doing the right things for the right reasons and that the justice system is always fair. Um, those are important concepts that we always need to strive toward, but I think those overarching concepts are what really helped lead us to, to the training series. I think the next slide will get into some of the specifics of, of, of what we tried to do. Um, number one was defining procedural justice, and that's something we did before we began the presentations. Right, we did a lot of research. We looked at um, them. Look, there are a lot of articles about what is procedural justice, and and I think these four pillars here um, absolutely highlight what procedural justice is and helped guide us in terms of wh where we are going. So, fairness in the process, uh, transparency in actions, opportunities for a voice, and impartiality in decision making. So when we came up with the topics, which I'll explain in a, in, in a minute or two, which will really be, I think, the, the meat of, of our discussion, each of those four pillars are the ones that we always referred back to. So if we were going to do a presentation, say, on, on diversion, did that fit into any or all of these prongs? Um, if we did one on implicit bias, did, did that fit into, into these prongs? And we wanted to make sure that by the time our fourth and final presentation was done, that we hit all of these pillars. And, and, and we did, but again, in the planning process, these were, this was a series of definitions that we always mm -hmm. referred back to. Um, I'd, I'd like to, if we go to the next slide, talk about the four specific presentations, because I think what I've talked about now has been, been on the general side, it's been a little bit about process, but, mm -hmm. It really was important, uh, sort of joked about it internally at times, but, but it was important that for a, a training series on procedural justice, that our internal procedures were robust. And, and they were, and it took time. It took many months. It took a lot of discussions. It took a lot of web research. It took a lot of conversations with different elected DAs, uh, with different assistant DAs, with former prosecutors, about what would be helpful and what are people discussing 
and how would we be able to reach our audience and our membership? Because not everyone necessarily understood what procedural justice was. Not everyone um, was initially uh, completely jazzed by the idea. And, and if they were, we wouldn't need to do it, right? Any organization needs to, needs to challenge uh, its members. Every organization needs to put information out there that's important to be aware of. And we made the point that even if folks don't always agree with everything that's been said, it's critical that you know, because these conversations during our training series are conversations that your constituents are having every day. So agree or disagree, that's fine, but at least be aware of, of what people are, are discussing. And that fits in perfectly with our, with our first presentation, which was, as you can see, Procedural Justice 101 and a Criminal Justice Policy Briefing. And we brought in Emily Lagrada, uh, an expert on procedural justice, uh, to teach us, to teach us about procedural justice, those four pillars, for example. And we had talked to Emily beforehand, so Emily was very helpful in getting us to define the pillars for our internal discussion purposes. Uh, but to discuss procedural justice, to explain why process matters, why our results are enhanced when there is a fair process, and why individuals involved in the system, including justice-involved individuals, really have a better feel for the system and are more confident in the system if the process itself is, is both fair and is perceived as fair. And then we had a policy briefing from a uh, law professor at Villanova Law School who was very involved in, in criminal justice policy matters in Pennsylvania. He's a former uh, counsel and member to our state sentencing commission. He often leads CLEs on criminal justice issues. Uh, his name is Professor Steve Chanenson for anyone, anyone who is curious. So he led us on a, an issue briefing. What are the issues of the day? What are the issues of the day that relate to procedural justice that are going on in both Pennsylvania and around the country? Bail reform, sentencing reform, uh, changes to uh, rules of procedure uh, in, various, in various aspects, uh, victims' rights, um, and, 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 and many areas in between. But Steve really helped us uh, go through those to understand journal articles that are being written and where, where some of the discussions are. Those two presentations, which occurred one after the other on, on the same day, I like to say set the table, right? They defined what procedural justice is with specifics. And then we had, had examples of the discussions going on throughout the country uh, in the reform space that are really based in large part on achieving procedural justice, wh whether one agrees with it or not, but at least being able to understand and appreciate uh, the, those issues. So we did that, and then we took a break for a couple of weeks and went to the next one. Uh, community relations, trust building, and implicit bias. And when we put this together, we really decided what was important was to have a mix of elected DAs and, and, and senior assistant DAs, senior deputy DAs, and folks from the outside, right? So our first series were two folks from the outside, Emily Lagrada and Steve Chanison, although Professor Chanison is a face known to most of our membership. So for community relations, trust building, and implicit bias, um, we had presentations from a major, uh, a larger county office in Pennsylvania, uh, including the elected and, and a couple members of his staff who frankly talked about what they do in the community. Uh, they talked about the importance of being involved in the community. Uh, they talked about some of the programs that they're implementing, some of the um, uh, youth, youth aid panel type programs in the juvenile system. Just an example, but it, it highlighted how having your assistants and your staff in your communities, talking to people in your communities, developing programs within your communities, and then following that up with discussions uh, with people in your communities, including people who are affected, people who are justice involved and victims uh, and, and many others, how that is critical to, to building trust and to refining your programs as well. You know, one of the interesting points about a juvenile diversion program 
from the person who, who ran it was how they learned uh, that in some of these programs, you're going to see people fail. They may get a, a, a good break in the system. They may avoid uh, exposure to incarceration, exposure to having a record, um, but something may not go right again. And, th and that, that's going to happen. And that at times it is appropriate to give people a second or even a third chance with, with some of these programs, that it's not you fail once and then you're going to go through the entire system and get a record and, and, and be incarcerated. That's not always the goal. Um, and I say that because that was a lesson that was learned only from being in the community and, and, and talking with people. So the fact that that discussion was led by members of our association, I think went a long way to explain to people who may not be as involved in the communities or who may be in the earlier part of that process or who maybe want to expand their reach and what they do, that this is a meaningful program. It's been vetted and implemented by a district attorney's office and it has worked really well. And I think Can for you having- tell, Sorry to interrupt. Can you tell us uh, what office that was and what size they are, the office? Yeah, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's Montgomery County, which is a uh, suburban Phil Philadelphia. It's one of our uh, largest, uh, largest counties. So they have, I forget how many ADAs they have, but they have many divisions and units. Their staff is well over a hundred, uh, if not more, lots of county detectives and, and victim witness coordinators. Um, it's a very robust office and uh, was a, you know, was a program that, uh, uh, that really worked again, because the, the person running it was involved within uh, within the community, and, and they shifted, I think, some of the ideas on um, on 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 recidivism, uh, and that's an area that that there's wealth in that in that county. There is there is major crime in that county, so it's very representative, I think, of of the Commonwealth. Uh, it's a very diverse community, um, so that 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 was, I think, an important uh, an important discussion. Um, we then shifted to a conversation on implicit bias. And I'm, I'm not gonna necessarily go into the discussion. I think lots of us have seen presentations on implicit bias. What was interesting here was that the person who gave the presentation uh, is a former first assistant district attorney in Philadelphia uh, who retired a number of years ago. And he now works still in Philadelphia in the, in, in the youth system. Uh, with an organization that really works at reducing youth violence uh, and as somebody that is beloved by law enforcement and those in the defense community and, and, and everybody in between and was able to give a, a really appropriate discussion about how to challenge yourselves when it comes to identifying implicit bias, recognizing implicit bias, not being embarrassed about it, um, but understanding that we all have to understand our our biases that everyone has implicit, uh, you know, a series of implicit biases, and and coming from a person of that of that caliber, and, and George uh, Mosey, who gave the presentation, is is black, and again served in law enforcement in his career, and he's now working uh, with 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 kids uh, at risk youth, uh, just brought so much to the table. We've had him at live uh, in person trainings um, as well. Uh, it, it, it went that well. It was, it's that important. It's that necessary. And the feedback was, was that good. Uh, that was a topic we felt that we had to have, frankly, with or without a procedural justice umbrella, that was absolutely necessary. And thankfully, it clearly fits within those, those four prongs of procedural justice. But going back to what I said earlier about one of the goals here was, was, was to challenge ourselves. Clearly that that, that was it. And one of the other goals I talked about was highlighting what we do so others can see what different offices are doing. I mean, that was part of the presentation on, on community relations and, and trust building. And you know, the, the third uh, bullet item here, diversion and reentry, uh, is, is very similar in that we had a, a, an elected DA talk about the reentry, the, the, the robust reentry programs in, in his county. And then we had an individual from Right on Crime in, in Texas talk about different reentry programs in different parts of the country, as well as some of the data 
about why reentry works, why you as a prosecutor should care about reentry and should be involved in your reentry re -entry programs, how reentry uh, advances and can achieve public safety. So it was, you know, a, a, a really robust discussion. And, and I think one of the really useful points, particularly coming from Dave Sunday, who's our York County DA who, who, who led that discussion, uh, was how to put these, these coalitions together. Who is on them, right? It's, it's many of us, most of us know what reentry is as a general matter, but operationally, how do you put it together? Who serves with you? How do you decide who serves? What should your role as an elected DA be? How do you bring in the faith-based community, for example? How do you bring in families, families of defendants, families of victims? How do you bring them into the same room? How do you look at research? How do you get folks from your office involved? Um, and how do you keep in touch with the issues that are going on with, with, within your communities? Because when you bring folks together like that, clearly, you're, that in, a, in and of itself is an achievement, but I don't think it's easy to, to actually do that. So when, when you have one of your own, and in this instance, that the, the head of our, the chair of our education and training committee sort of go through that level of detail um, and the, the scope of the reentry programs, as well as how we put them together, backed up by a right-leaning group uh, in Texas, uh, that talked about why reentry works, what are some models of reentry. It was a really good balance of highlighting and challenging. And it was a really good balance of having one of your own and also having somebody from the outside come in and, and offer that. Um, and I can't emphasize that enough. I think if you're going to do a training or program like this, if it's multi, multi day training, if it's one, um, there are so many folks from around the country who could do a great job. But I think if you're an association or if, you, or if you're an office doing it or multiple offices coming together, bringing in some folks uh, in your own world who work for you or who work with you, who are known to your participants really goes a long way. And then you can balance that out by bringing in some national experts as well. That's a really good combination. Our last training was on data. And that was uh, the one training that was uh, done by the same institution. It was the Quattron Center for the Fair Administration of Justice at the University of Pennsylvania Law School. And the primary participant was uh, Professor Heaton, Dr. Heaton, uh, who really um, is, is, is the academic brains of the operation. Many others do wonderful things there. Uh, Dr. Heaton uh, is also a professor of law at, at the law school. And this was a two-part training. Number one was, how can you use data in your office? Don't be scared of data. In fact, to the contrary, use data, get data, embrace data. Uh, and Dr. Heaton talked about ways you could examine if, if you have changed your bail procedures, how can you track whether that is enhanced safety, whether there have been detractions from safety, whether it's somewhere in the middle, whether you need to fine tune some things, or if you're doing reentry programs, how can you track recidivism rates uh, and ways, a lot of operational discussions here, but uh, how can you get it? What are some opportunities to try to get funding in order to, to do this? Because as we know, data collection and data analysis uh, is not cheap. And in many counties or commissioners just don't have the funds to allow us to buy some pretty expensive programs. So what are some funding opportunities? What are some even some ways of, of doing more back of the envelope kinds of kinds of calculations or getting interns uh, or people who have studied economics who can who can look at that? But really, the overall message was embrace data and, and start to use it to make your community safer. And then the second part of this presentation was a little more academic. And it was, hey, there are a lot of studies out there. There are a lot of studies. And if you if you're on social media like like I am, it is overwhelming. Professor X says this, and Professor Y says that. Professor X is a criminologist. Professor Y is an economist. And my God, these two things are actually completely contradictory, but these are both well-regarded people. What's on the X, Y axis? What's on the Y? There are graphs here. Oh my God, I went to law school. <laughs> I, I didn't get a master's in public policy because I never liked economics or 
this kind of thing. So Dr. Heaton really talked us through um, many concepts. I won't bore you with the details here, but it was things about causation and correlation and what are utterly simplistic uh, conclusions that you'll see in the newspaper or in some articles and, and what are better ways of understanding uh, randomized data, what are uh, ways of uh, anonymous surveys, um, and, and many areas like that. And, and it, was, uh, it was academic in nature. Um, I think folks who were on the call who came from an appeals background were the ones who absolutely loved it. I started my legal career out as an appeals attorney, so I was riveted by it. Um, it was one of those, um, it was the fourth one. We probably had the biggest drop off in terms of people on. Um, some people found parts of it relevant, others didn't. Um, and I say that as somebody who loved the presentation. Um, I say that because I think one of the themes that was important as we were putting it together is that in this four part series, so it's really almost eight hours, not everyone is gonna love every part of it. And I guarantee you, not everyone loved the re-entry discussion. Not everyone loved implicit bias. But for the people who were on it, many people loved every uh, different aspects of it. So everybody got something. There were people out there who were uh, in love with the data presentation, who thought that the criminal justice policy briefing really brought together so many different areas of policy debate, that the diversion discussion from right on crime really crystallized a lot of concepts. We can't make everyone happy with every presentation and that's okay because if we did, it wouldn't be a challenging presentation, right? It wouldn't be provocative. It would just be a very blah, middle of the road kind of thing. That's fine. But at the end of the day, it would not achieve our goal of really trying to uh, educate people and excite people and, and challenge people. And, and, and I hope we did that. I think we did that. Our feedback was, 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 was very good. Um, you know, we say during the COVID insanity, um, there were a few good things that came out out of it. I, I think this is one of those because this is a training that really worked virtually. Um, I wouldn't necessarily recommend it to be in person unless it's maybe one part of a full day presentation, but to do something as robust as this um, really worked. Uh, online, because even when people couldn't sign up because they were doing other things, they were able to jump on a week, a month, three months later and, and, and get CLE credit. So if we were to start it now, when people are getting back to the courtroom, I'm not sure how we would do it, but certainly then uh, it, it, it worked out well. I do think in the world where we're all a little more virtual now, um, being able to get people from around the country to work with people from individual DA's offices obviously works in that in that virtual forum. So that's a bit of an overview. Um, Chris, we'd love to answer any questions. Well, thank you, Greg. This was um, a very interesting discussion about topics that are cutting edge for many prosecutors. Um, and you've mixed and matched the um, the speakers between prosecutors speaking about their own programs and bringing in outsiders. Um, have you thought of follow-up to this so that you can uh, solicit from your membership whether any of them have tried aspects of this and whether there were challenges or successes that came from it? Yeah, a couple of things. Number one, uh, one of the immediate follow-ups was the implicit bias, I mean, all the trainings were all, all got positive reviews. Uh, I think the implicit bias presentation uh, not only got positive reviews, but that was the one where people said, everyone, everyone, everyone needs to see this. So that is one that we've had George uh, do in, in some of our live presentations. So that was one area of feedback. On our education and training committee, we do discuss uh, what other areas we should explore. I, I don't think we're going to repeat uh, any of these topics, but we've had some general discussions. We're actually going to have more at our next meeting, which is coming up, about uh, doing another couple presentations, virtual presentations during the year. We're still in, in sort of the discussion phase. Uh, we haven't uh, really wrapped our arms about what, what to do next. I will say part of that is we're back to live trainings. So getting back to that universe, quite frankly, has taken up all of our 
our, our training time, um, but we have committed ourselves to doing more with uh, the procedural justice trainings. I will say one area uh, that I think is a necessity and, and that people really want to hear more about is, is trauma, because as I discussed at the beginning, procedural justice, yet that is for those who are defendants, those are for victims and witnesses. It's for defenders and prosecutors and judges. I mean, everyone is involved. Um, trauma, I think, is a similar dynamic, right? There is victim trauma, but there's defendant trauma. And then there are witnesses who have suffered from trauma. So in terms of people understanding and bringing in a broad perspective, that that's that's one one area we've we've talked about. But no doubt there are many more that I haven't thought of, but but it's an area we're continuing to to discuss mentioned that you recorded these presentations. Are they available to anyone outside of your association? If, if people want to see it, I would say drop me a line or they can contact you, Chris, and you can drop me a line. We generally, with our CLEs, keep them in-house, but if folks are, want to do a presentation, um, I, I can work with anybody and we can, uh, we, we, can, we can share some things. So if someone is interested, You'd be uh, you'd be willing to send something to prosecutors who are interested in the, in seeing the recordings. Would love well, to. Thank you. Yes. Thank you so much. Um, so I want to thank Greg Rowe, Sophia. Did you have any questions uh, before I, I turn this over to the last? No, I, I I don't. It was a a very uh, thorough presentation, and just really uh, appreciate your willingness to share this information so that other people can. Uh, benefit from your uh, expertise in this area. Thank you. Yeah, and I uh, want to thank you, uh, Greg, for uh, being willing to broach new subjects with prosecutors. Again, some people agree, some people don't, but being exposed to these new ideas only makes everyone better. So we really appreciate your efforts and thank you so much. Thank you.